morning. Okay, hey, good morning. Let's all find our seats. Somebody flick the lights off and on. Everybody knows that's the international signal for go back to your desk. All right, thanks everyone. All right. Okay, real quickly before the uh, announcements and offering, just a couple of things to talk about. Um, oh. So you, everyone was here. Oh, everyone was here on Easter. Everyone saw how busy we were on Easter. And the uh, folks that haven't been here um, very long don't understand how full we are. I mean, honestly, if you've been here 12 months ago, well, 12 months ago we were locked down. So a, a couple of things. One, we're trying to um, build up our usher and greeter team. I want to toss that out to folks. Um, if you're interested at all, please go ahead and fill out one of the white cards. Um, it is such an amazing opportunity to get to know folks, learn people's names. Um, the story I, I always tell if you've been here very long at all, you've heard me say it. I was up here, I'll never forget the day I was up here doing something like this, you know. And I looked around and I thought, I know the name of every person in this church. It blew me away. It just did. It just blew me away. Um, I started out just parking cars. I was walking across the parking lot one Sunday morning and there were the guys out there and they said, hey, you want to park cars? <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, I'll park cars. It's kind of fun. You smile at people, point at a parking spot. It's... <laughs> I loved it. You know, it was a blast. And uh, next thing you know, I was greeting at the door, and then I was doing the offering, and now here I am. And it has been an amazing thing. And just for anyone, if it, it's a great way to just make connections with people. And you don't have to learn everybody's name, but it's a great way to just learn the name of a handful of people and just build connection. Um, and just build connection. It's really, really an amazing thing to do. So please, um, if you're interested at all, please fill out one of the white cards in the back there, um, one of our Connect cards, and just let us know. And I'll reach out to you. The other thing is I want to remind folks that um, I have a Bible study here on Wednesdays at 6 a.m. Uh, men's Bible study, just so everybody understands that. It's a great way to start your day. You know what? If you're going to be at work or working from home by 8 o'clock in the morning anyway, just set your alarm a little bit earlier, put on your big guy pants, and come on down here. <laughs> you can wear shorts. I don't care if you wear your jammy pants. It's okay. But if you want to come down here at 6 o'clock in the morning, right now we're going through the book of Acts, and we're just going to read a chapter and then just kind of discuss it, just a little popcorn conversation around the room and, and uh, just, just get into it. And it's an hour. We're, in it. We're out of here by 7 o'clock, off to do our day. And it's a really amazing way to start the day. I value that time so much. So um, 6 a.m. Wednesdays, just show up. I'll be here. Lights will be on. Easy peasy. And now, right. Thank you, Russ. Uh, Russ is uh, one of our elders here, and we are, we are happy that he's here. We like him. He's also the head of our usher ministry. All right, well, uh, if you're new with us, we have a, a Connect card here that uh, you can fill out just to let us know that you are here. You can drop this in the plate as it's going by. There's uh, spots to check if you'd like more information about anything or um, if you're ready to take your next step and uh, serve in an area, you can check that on the back. Or if you have any prayer requests, you can do that as well. And so a couple of different ways to give. You can drop it in the plates, online. Um, you can text to give. You can go to radiantofcanvas.org, however you'd like to. Let's bow our heads and pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for um, just who you are, God. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your provision in our lives. Lord, you give us our daily bread. You take care of our every need. And we praise you for it. And we thank you for it this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, as those plates are going by... Um, we'll just pass those right through the aisles there. And as those are going by, um, as Russ mentioned earlier, we are uh, continuing to grow. We're continuing to expand. Uh, we were packed out on Easter and really, really excited to be able to do that. And so as the Lord continues to bring growth here at Radiant, as he continues to uh, just give favor to us, um, we want to continue to move the, the corners of the tent out. We want to continue to expand that net and catch that growth that the Lord is giving us. And so starting in May, the first week of May, we are going to be going to four services, just like we did on Easter. And so there's a little secret. That was a test run. And it went well, and we were really excited to be able to do that. And so we're going to be doing those same service times. So we'll have a Saturday 6 p.m. service 
and uh, three services on Sunday, one at 8.30, one at 10, and one at 11.35. And I know you're wondering, and yes, we do need those extra five minutes. Yes, we do. <laughs> and so we are really excited to uh, continue to steward the growth that the Lord has for us here and, um, and to see what he's going to do next. I think it's going to be pretty amazing because we serve an amazing God. All right, I'm going to invite Pastor Jeremy up, and he's going to preach the word to us. <clears throat> we are beginning a new uh, series uh, this uh, weekend uh, called The Psalter, How to Talk to God, How to Commune with Heaven. And we have an amazing uh, book of the Bible called The Psalms, uh, which is, if, if all of Scripture, if all the rest of Scripture is God, God's divine word speaking to us, the Psalter is, uh, the Psalms are God's divine word teaching us how to talk to him. And so we're going to look at Psalm 57. Before we get into it, uh, uh, join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this time that we do come uh, before you. We want to sit under your word as it's read. Uh, help us to hear uh, what you would have to say. May uh, your living and active word do its thing in our, in our midst, in our hearts today. And I also pray your blessing upon uh, the preaching. Help me to speak clearly and truthfully uh, this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with me as we read from Psalm 57, verse 1. <clears throat> be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out, to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts, the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want you to take a look at this um, Peanuts comic strip. I may be a fan of uh, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, and the gang. Uh, this is the very first one that Charles Schultz ever published. The first Peanuts strip. Shows uh, Charlie Brown coming down and says, Well, here comes old Charlie Brown. Good old Charlie Brown, yes, sir. Good old Charlie Brown. How I hate him. Now, uh, one of the th ongoing premises of the Peanuts strip uh, that Charles Schultz laid out through all the years of any decades that he did that strip was that life is hard and, li and, and fraught with, with difficulty. Uh, that was the idea. Charlie Brown, man, the dude can never get a break. Never got to kick that football. Never won a single baseball game in all the decades that he was pitching for his team. As faithful as he was to be there and to show up and keep trying... He just couldn't get a break. That was the whole idea. And what's uh, interesting is that, you know, it does kind of hit true to home, that life is difficult. Life is hard. It's a foregone conclusion that in life we will face troubles, uh, troubles that are an elemental part of what it means to live in a fallen world. Suffering is not optional. 
uh, the goal of humanity is not to find all kinds of ways. I think that is the goal that many are pursuing. But if your goal is, I'm going to find a way to live life without ever suffering, it's not going to work. Suffering is not optional. It is a fact of life. As the Princess Bride taught us, life is pain. Anyone who tells you differently is selling something. However, we do have the option. We don't have the option of avoiding suffering. And if you're young, you might go, what are you talking about? Everything just seems pretty fine. Just live long enough. And you experience the harsh realities of life's ups and downs. You see uh, you know, relationships that you never thought would come to an end come crashing to a halt. People that you never thought would not be a part of your life suddenly gone for one reason or another. That is the harsh reality of life. So we can't avoid that, but we do have an option. Are we going to respond to these trials and tribulations? Are we going to respond to these hardships with the way of heaven or the way of the world? Are we going to respond uh, heavenly or hellishly? Now consider the trouble that David was facing when he wrote Psalm 57. In this series, we're looking at five different psalms of the 16. Uh, that were written by David, where we get not just the psalm, but also in the title, it's included the context in which he wrote that psalm. In this case, he wrote this psalm when he was in the cave. Now, why was he in the cave? Why was he hiding? The one who was anointed to be king, who was the hero of Israel, is hiding in a cave with a bunch of dropouts, with a ragtag group hiding from the king, who was King Saul. The troubles became a, uh, a started because of King Saul's jealousy. David had been very uh, successful in, in battle, and so things went really bad for David when uh, the people of Israel started singing a song. There was a top 40 hit, number one top 40 hit in that day, and it went something like this. Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his ten thousands. And when Saul heard that, it was bad news for David. Uh, he, David served in the court of the king, and he would play music to soothe Saul when he was experiencing a troubling spirit, and when he would play for him, it would go away. So he was there to just do that. And yet the jealousy of Saul was such that all of a sudden when David's playing, he grabs a spear and Hah! he would kept on trying to pin him to the wall. David would run away and keep on serving. And then finally, Saul mustered his entire army to go and pursue David to destroy him, and that's when he found himself hiding in a cave, hiding in a cave. Now, how did David respond to this? At first, he fled, but eventually, this ragtag group that gathered around him in the cave became one of the most renowned fighting forces of the ancient world, David's mighty men. They were an amazing bunch of guys, but what David did is, or what he didn't do, is he never sent this amazing fighting force to attack Saul. He didn't do that. Actually, on two different occasions, David could have easily killed Saul when he was on the run from King Saul. Uh, he once he found himself in a cave where Saul was, it's kind of strange, but he was relieving himself. And he cut a little bit of his garment, that's how distracted Saul was, and then said, look how close I was to you, Saul, but I did not kill you. And then later, a deep sleep came over the whole camp where Saul and his army were camped out, and David was able to go right next to Saul, and one of David's men said, let me just pin him to the ground and kill him. And he said, no, no, I'm not going to raise a hand against the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to raise a hand against the king. Now, how in the world was David able to not take action in that moment? How was he able to stay his hand? What did he do in, in his... Uh, in his uh, 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 abstinence from wanting to destroy Saul is David went the way of heaven. In short, he refused to become Saul to defeat Saul. He refused to become Saul in order to defeat Saul. Every day we have a choice as we face the troubles of the day. The way of heaven or the way of hell? The way of heaven or the spirit of the world? The way of heaven is my life for yours. A life of self-sacrifice. That's the way of heaven. The way of hell, or the spirit of the world, is your life for mine. Now, was Saul bad for the nation of Israel? 
Yeah, you betcha. He was bad for the nation of Israel. But David knew that it would be just as bad for the country if he attained the throne with Saul-like methods. It would be just as bad to dethrone Saul and become Saul. In becoming Saul, things would be no better for the nation. It's important to note also that this wasn't a random persecution that David was experiencing here. This opposition came about because of the call of God on his life. He could have, David could have easily sought safety, security, and comfort if he were to have abandoned following this call. A couple of ways he could have abandoned the call. Either one, by giving up on becoming king, just saying to Samuel, who anointed him as king, Samuel, you keep it, man. I don't want it. I want no part of this thing. I just want to go in the field and write my songs. I want to tend to the sheep and, and just worship my Lord whom, whom I love. I, that's what I want to do. So keep the king business, and, and I want no part of it. Could have done that, and everything would have gone away. Or he could have become Saul to defeat Saul. Just, but the difference for him is he say, yes, I'm becoming Saul, but I'm doing it in the name of heaven. Either way would have been uh, veering from the call of God in his life, which was to be a godly king. In the same way, we can take the easier road and stray from following the call of God that he has for us as the church of Christ in, to, in this hour that we live. We can stray from our call by either pursuing a heavenly cause in a way contrary to heaven or by giving up in a cowardly fashion. Either by saying, you know what, it's all just a big mess. I want none part of it. I'm just going to separate myself and just try to enjoy me and my God on my own here. Or to say, I will fight a heavenly cause in a way contrary to heaven. Walking in the way of heaven, walking this life of self-sacrifice, of self-denial that the Bible calls us to, that Jesus calls us to. Uh, to be a disciple is one who's to pick up his Christ daily, deny himself daily, and follow him. That's hard. It's hard. It's not easy to lay your life down in that way. It is hard, especially at times, very hard, because it goes completely against the grain of our fleshly nature. It goes completely against the grain. It's easier to, cho to choose worldliness over godliness but it's far more costly. It's easier to choose worldliness over godliness, but the cost is much, much higher. If David had chosen to either give up and not pursue becoming king or to become Saul to defeat Saul, what would the cost have been to Israel? What would the cost have been to his own soul? It would not have been good. What will the cost be to our nation? If God's people walk in the spirit of the world to defeat the world instead of becoming like Christ in order to win the world. How in the world, again, and come back to this, how is David able to do this? Because you might be saying, you know, brother, I'm facing some, some difficulties in my life, some difficult challenges, whether it's in your family situation, or you might say we as the church are facing a very difficult time in uh, the, the, the culture that we live in, in our particular context here in the United, the United States, uh, in the Western world. You might say, this is a difficult thing. I guarantee it's not as bad, whatever you got going on, as what David was experiencing. He <laughs> was, ha had a, an army pursuing it that was so bent on destroying him that Saul said, either uh, I'm going to kill David or I'm going to die trying. He wasn't going to give up, and he didn't give up. You're probably not experiencing that, hiding in a cave with an entire army chasing not just you and your friends, but just you, you alone. And so David had that going on, and yet he was able to walk in the way of heaven. How? How was he able to do that? His prayer that we see that he wrote in Psalm 57 here reveals five keys that will help us walk in the way of heaven. Ways we can talk to God, commune to God, pray to the Lord. And uh, one of the things that we see that David did 
uh, there was one time in particular where he had to go uh, and, and do a, a very heroic thing. And before he did it, it said he strengthened himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. How do we do that? Here's a key. Five things. First thing we see that David did is that he humbled himself before God. David's first step is humility, which is always our first step into the way of heaven. It's always humility. If we cannot humble ourselves before God, we'll never go into the world with a spirit of humility. If you can't humble yourself before God, you're never going to humble yourself before your fellow man. It's not happening. Actually, a little key here. If you've ever been in a situation where you and your spouse or someone very close to you have, are experiencing intense fellowship, uh, you're experiencing uh, you know, a conversation that moves into a disagreement, that moves into a heated disagreement, that starts escalating into something worse. Now, why is that escalation taking place? Is it because the other person's not listening to you? No. Well, that might be part of it, but it's not only that. It's pride. Anytime you're in a conversation and it's getting heated and it's no longer productive, it's just a mess, pride is the reason that is occurring. And so a key, God says that he gives grace to the humble but opposes the proud. So if you continue to walk in your pride in that conversation, guess what? It's not just the person you're talking to that's going to oppose you, but God himself will oppose you and you're not going to win. Uh, yet, though, but at the same time, he gives grace to the humble. And so if that moment... When you're having, if you notice that, that escalation beginning to take place, whether it's online or with someone close to you, the best thing to do is to stop, pause, and say, can we pray? And you humble yourself before the Lord. You might not have any desire to humble yourself before the person who's being mean to you or, or is not agreeing with you, who's aggravating you or annoying you, but you can humble yourself before God. And so you say, Lord... Would you come and help us? Clearly, we're not handling this conversation in a way that's productive. Would you come and allow your grace to come in? We need your help. We have mercy upon us as we and help my words. Help us to have a productive dialogue. Help me to love my, my spouse in this situation and to honor you in this moment. Help me, Lord, please. I guarantee you do that. Everything changes because God gives grace to the humble. And so that's what David does. He humbles himself. Three ways he humbles himself. First, he cries out for mercy in verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. This is, indicates that he sees himself as unworthy, and he needs mercy and grace. If David had believed uh, that he deserved better from God than he was getting in the cave, he would not have been able to reflect heaven's love in his circumstance. All that he would reflect is his own self-centeredness. See, and so David, because he, you know, he doesn't say, Lord, what's going on here? I was supposed to be king. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've been kind. I'm, I'm, go, I'm trying to go, but, but this is happening. What's up with this? You know, we're just trying to move heaven you know, to do what we want. We're trying to boss God around in those moments as opposed to saying, hey, listen, I'm a sinner and I need grace. I need mercy. And so, Lord, I, it's your mercy that can come into this situation and make things right. And so David humbles himself by crying out for mercy. Second, he looks to God for refuge. This reveals that he recognizes that he is vulnerable before his enemies. He is not self-sufficient. Interesting story. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Chuck Yeager? Ever heard the name Chuck Yeager? A couple of you. He was uh, a, a famous pilot, very, very amazing pilot. He was the first individual ever to fly at the speed of sound. And at the time, it was in the late, late 40s, I think it was 1947 when he finally did it, people that had tried to break the sound barrier before him, because, you know, things, it's crazy what happens uh, when you're right when you're approaching the sound barrier, you start to, sh uh, uh, plane starts to shake right before you, you, you're hitting the resistance there, and, and the pl people would just blow up. And so, and all, all kinds of nutty things would happen when you're up there doing that. Again, this is, on, and these are in like, uh, you know, experimental aircraft that they're trying to do this in. It was jet engines were very new, cutting edge. And so he's up there uh, flying with a rocket that basically propelling him forward. They, they would actually go up in a B-52 plane 
because he wouldn't take off from the ground, and they'd drop the plane, and then <laughs> he'd take off and try to break the sound barrier. Interesting thing about him, though, he was a God-believing man, but he never would pray before a flight. And his reasoning was, it's just me and the plane up there. God can't help me. I need to rely on my skill, my wits, and my instinct to help me through this, and so I'm not even going to pray. Now, that's not the best approach. <laughs> Now, on the one hand, if you just say, you know, Jesus, take the wheel in every circumstance of my life, and that means, therefore, that I don't even have to try or I don't need to grow in my skill and grow in my capacity to do good in the world, that is also an error. We have work that we have to do that is uh, fueled by God's grace and mercy in our life. So we, we don't want to be lazy, but if we think that, you know, God can't help me here, I have to figure this out, that is a dangerous place to be. David didn't do that. His refuge was not in the cave. His refuge was not in the army that surrounded him. His his refuge was not in his military prowess or even his own righteousness. His refuge was in God alone. This is a phrase that David uses over and over again in the Psalms. He continually comes back to this. Lord, you are my fortress. You are my high tower. You are my refuge. So he humbles himself by crying out for mercy and going to God for refuge. And then it gets even more interesting in the way that he describes this refuge. How does he describe this refuge in this particular context? He calls, he, he refu- he calls the refuge the shadow of God's wings. And in doing so, he likens himself to a little chick or a bird in a nest. Now, how many of you are familiar with the Back to the Future saga? first one was amazing. 1985, one of the best movies of the 80s. And the success of that movie caused him to make two more, which were fun because of the first one, but not the best in my humble opinion. Uh, But one of the things that they wrote into the character of Marty McFly, played by Michael J. Fox, uh, in that uh, second and third installment was that uh, Marty had an unusually strong aversion to being called chicken. And it caused all kinds of problems in his life. If someone called him chicken, he'd say, nobody calls me chicken, nobody. And he'd make horrible decisions after that. Uh, So David wasn't afraid to call himself a chicken. David, the mighty warrior, the anointed of God, says, in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge. Or put another way, I'm a little chick, and I need the covering of my God. So he humbles himself. And so in prayer... When you're facing difficulty, we cry out for mercy and we look to God for refuge knowing that it's not our skill and prowess that's going to get us through this situation. It's God's mercy. It's he is our refuge. He is our help. Second thing he does is he cries out to God. Uh, Verse 2, he says, I cry out to God most high. The word cry there is a strong word. It means to shout. It's, it's, an, inten- it's not, it's not a, an emotionally measured prayer. It's an intense lament. It's a, if you've ever been, a, been in a prayer meeting and someone, uh, you, you might have seen someone pray in an exercised fashion where they're just really animated, but if someone cries out, it's actually a bit off-putting. It's disturbing. It's like, whoa, slow down, hoss. You know, come on, let's get, get control of your horses and then come into this prayer time because you're making us all feel uncomfortable. What's wrong with you? You know, that's, but David didn't care about all that. It was an intense crying out to the Lord. It was also a very emotionally honest prayer. As he describes his situation in verse four, he says, my soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. He's honestly, ta- he's not pretending like this. He's not uh, uh, um, trying to dumb down the situation to make it more palatable. He's not saying, well, it's not too bad. No, he's honest. He's like, this is serious. I'm in danger here. The words of the people, the, 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 they're attacking me. This matters. One of the hallmarks of a healthy prayer life is that at times we come to God raw, honest, and broken. We don't ignore the problem that we're facing. We don't try, because why would you do that? Psychologically, you're overwhelmed, so if you pretend and convince yourself that it's not really that big of a deal, it makes you feel a little bit better. It does no good. It's not helpful. It's not helpful to you. It doesn't help the situation at all to uh, face it and just pretend like everything's all right. But at the same time, 
we, if we also just try to pretend that we've got it all together, that I know the situation's overwhelming, but I'm a stalwart you know, follower of Jesus, and I'm doing fine. We, if we feel like we can only come to God in our best form, then that will really wreak havoc on our communion with heaven. We come to him raw, honest, and broken with the idea that it's only in the presence of a holy and merciful God that we are made right. It does no good pretending that you have it all together. God knows better. You're not hiding anything from him. So we cry out to heaven with raw, honest prayers. We humble ourselves and we cry out to heaven. We're honest with heaven. Third, David trusts in God's sovereignty. David's trust in the sovereignty of God is demonstrated in a couple of ways. This is key. If we're going to rise above our circumstances as opposed to being consumed by our circumstance, we must trust in the sovereignty of God. And David, we see it in two different ways. One is in verse 2, he says, I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. David recognizes that it's God who fulfills his purpose. John Calvin puts it this way. He says, this prayer uh, this, this particular part of the prayer of David um, materially confirms and sustains our hope to reflect that God will never forsake the workmanship of his own hands, that he will perfect the salvation of his people and continue his divine guidance until he have brought them to the termination of their course. Like I prayed from uh, Philippians 1 earlier in our service, it is he who began a good work in us that will carry it on to completion. We trust God's sovereign hand to do that and to accomplish that. It helps us rise above the situation as opposed to being consumed by it. And what I mean by being consumed by it is uh, to be consumed by a circumstance is that you're drawn into an anxious attitude that believes, I have to handle this situation perfectly for it to go well. I have to push all the right buttons. It's up to me. A God is up in heaven going, all right, are you going to do the seven things you need to do here for things to work out? I'm waiting. I'm watching. And I have to do it all just perfect. And then heaven will move. If you think that way, you're going to be an anxious wreck. Because everything's riding on you. Thankfully, God is bigger than our mistakes and our imperfections. I got news for you. Whatever situation you're facing, whether it's a family situation, personal situation, or larger it is, God is not dependent upon your perfection for heaven to shine in that situation. Hallelujah. He's not, he's, not, uh, re, he's not waiting for you just to be smart enough or strong enough to get through it. He is our strength. He will carry that situation on to completion. That's one aspect of his sovereignty that helps us rise above the situation. Another one is that David trusts that God will sovereignly do justice. That he will do something, he will, that evil will be dealt with. When the bill comes due, God will settle all accounts. For those who are in Christ, they will receive grace. For those who are not, they will receive judgment. And uh, in order for us to be a peaceable, patient, and gentle kind of people with those who we perceive to be evildoers, we must believe that on the one hand, God is a divine judge who sees things clearly and will judge evil one day. Now, to see things clearly is important. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you judged the situation and had an intense judgment of that situation, only later to find out more information and realize, ooh, I was way off there? Anybody? God never has that problem. He sees things perfectly, and he will execute judgment. Thankfully, that uh, for us, that judgment fell upon his son when he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death we should have died. He, just the son of God, took the full wrath of heaven. And so those in Christ oh, don't have to worry about that. But whether it's on Christ or on uh, God deals with the situation of evil in the end. And so on the one hand, you trust in that. But on the other hand, you trust that God is the only one who can punish evil without becoming evil. I, we, we cannot engage in punishing evil without becoming evil ourselves. We, we, if we become Saul to defeat Saul, we become corrupted. 
Whereas God doesn't do that. Look at verse um, 3. He's, David says, he will send from heaven and save me. How? He will put to shame him who tramples on me. So on the one hand here, he's saying, yes, judgment's coming. He's going to deal with this evil that's coming against me. And, though, he says, God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. So God is able to work in that situation, and he's operating in steadfast love and faithfulness. And we trust that it's only God who can do that perfectly. That's why uh, God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay. So we trust, as we trust him to do that, we're able to, that's how David, in my uh, 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 judgment, was able to say, I'm not going to kill Saul here. I trust the Lord. Heaven will take, God will take care of that. If I do it, evil will become me. Fourth thing David does, he recognizes that the world's methods are self-destructive. In verse 6, he talks about how uh, the, the enemies laid a trap for him, but they fell in it themselves. David knows that if he tried to do to Saul what Saul had done to him, he would experience the same judgment as Saul that he knew that was coming for Saul. The Christian should heed the warnings of Scripture, such as it says in Galatians 6, 7 through 8, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whoever or whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh, uh, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap corruption eternal life. If we as Christians sow division, slander, pride, enmity, impurity, cowardice, strife, what are we going to reap? Division, enmity, it's, it's corruption. It will not go well with us. And as we pray these truths, it's not enough to just believe that to be true. As we take our situations and we acknowledge the truth of the situation and we pray it's, it's, it's cultivated, that reality, that nature is cultivated in our hearts as we pray like David in this way. So those are the first four things. Let's close with this last one. God, or David exalts God most high. He, ex, he exalts God. We, as I often say, are always at our best when we're making much of Jesus. We are always at our best when we're making much of Jesus. St. Augustine puts it this way. He says, I call love the motion of the soul toward the enjoyment of God for his own sake and the enjoyment of oneself and of one's neighbor for the sake of God. It mean, what, the, what is he saying there? It's, it's, um, our lo- it's easy to make our love, of God, uh, the love for God about ourselves. It's very easy to do that. For, for example, um, you can make your love for God about you because you're just saying, you know what, God, I love you because you give me good things. I, you, you give me all these good things, therefore, I love you. And Augustine goes on to say, if we do that, it'd be like this. Imagine someone you care about very, very deeply, someone that you love more than anybody else, let's say. You love them so much, you say, you know what, I want to get them a gift. But not just any gift. I want to find just the perfect gift that would really bless them, and they'd be just blown away by. And so you come up with it, you save your money, and you get this thing, and you give it to them. And after you give it to them, the response is this. This gift is so amazing that, frankly, I never have to see your face again. This gift is all I need. I don't need to spend time with you. I don't need to see you. I just want this gift. Have a nice life. Thank you so much. That's loving God for our own sake. But when we love God, not because of the things he gives, we love him for him. In that case, if the loved one gives you that gift and you say, this shows me how much you love me, but it means something to me because of my love for you. Yeah, not the love for the gift. When we make our aim to move into to do this, to say, I'm going to make it all about Jesus. I love God for his sake, but I love others for his sake. I'm doing it all for heaven. I want to make much of Jesus. I want all of my actions to reflect well on God because of my love for God. I want to never dishonor the name of the Lord in anything that I do. If we keep that, if that is our aim, that moves us into Christ-likeness. And the way that we keep that our aim is authentic worship. David moves into the last part of this psalm by saying, I'm going to worship you, Lord. And he has all these beautiful ways he worships God. He, he says, I'm going to proclaim your steadfast love and your faithfulness 
in, uh, before the nations, before people. It's a public proclamation. I'm going to tell everyone about how amazing you are, God. And he's, I'm, going to, I'm going to be consumed with thanksgiving. I'm going, to be, I'm going to worship you in the morning. I'm going to wake the dawn with my praise. I'm going to, my devotion will be from the moment I wake to the moment that I lay down. My devotion to you is everything. But how does he move into that praise and that exaltation? He says in verse 7 um, that... He says it twice. He says, my heart is steadfast. My heart is steadfast. Now, what does that mean? Before he moves into this praise, he says, my heart is steadfast. Anytime in Semitic language you see the repeating, that means there's an extra emphasis on this situation here, or what, what he's declaring. To be steadfast here, the word steadfast means to be prepared or to make ready. So he did not rush into praise. He didn't just say, hallelujah, this praise that he gives to the Lord flows out of deep meditation. He's taken time to consider the steadfast love and the faithfulness of God to such a degree that now, it, it, he's, as, he, as you meditate on the goodness of God, as you really take time to slow down and meditate on the scriptures and see what it reveals about heaven, something amazing happens. Something supernatural happens. That scripture, those truths go radioactive in your life. And it erupts in devotion and praise. Praise of that sort will melt our heart into the shape of heaven. That's what David did. And that's what we need to do. So my question is, how are you doing with all this? You may be facing trials and troubles that are very personal. Or you might be saying, you know what, I just turn on my news feed and I'm overwhelmed with troubles. How are you doing? Are you responding to all of that with the way of heaven or with the way of the world? Are you being like David and saying, I want, I'm going to approach this troubling situation, approach, approach this evil that we're facing by saying, my life for yours. I'm going to engage in this, uh, all the relationships that, that, would, um, that would define my ability to have influence in this situation. They're going to be service-based relationships as opposed to power-based relationships. I will make my way as opposed to I will love my way forward. May we pray like David, prayers that are, and, and walk in humility, honesty, trust, discernment, and praise so that heaven would shine through us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. We've looked to your word. Thank you for these prayers of David, these psalms of David that instruct us how to talk with you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us move into a space as, a, as the people of God where we'd face the troubles of our day like uh, with the way of heaven. Help our prayer life to be enriched, our communion with you to be such that we walk in this, where we, we would humble ourselves before you, that we would trust in your sovereignty, that we would be able to be honest with you, that you give us discernment to understand the actions that we're taking that are uh, self-destructive versus the ones that are exalting and honoring you. Help us to walk in the way of praise, a, a, steadfa- a pra- praise that comes out of a steadfast meditation, a pr- preparation. May we come into the house of God, worshiping you, not only waiting till that second to have ever thought of you that all week, but a week's worth of communion that would erupt in a corporate praise that would be an honor to you. Help us to be that people so that we would shine with the love and the light of heaven in every situation we find ourselves in, I pray in your name. Amen. Please stand.